Toronto. VK on the beat. Uh -huh. Check. Uh -huh. I'm in Toronto where you wanna get the city love. Oh. I'm from Toronto where you wanna get the city love. Okay. I'm in Toronto where you wanna get the city love. That's right. My city love me back. Welcome to episode 1076 of Toronto Miked, proudly brought to you by Great Lakes Brewery, a fiercely independent craft brewery who believes in supporting communities, good times, and brewing amazing beer. Order online for free local home delivery in the GTA. StickerU.com. Create custom stickers, labels, tattoos, and decals for your home and your business. Palma Pasta. Enjoy the taste of fresh, homemade Italian pasta and entrees from Palma Pasta in Mississauga and Oakville. Doer, the world's most comfortable pants and shorts. Save 15% with the promo code Toronto Mike. Ridley Funeral Home, pillars of the community since 1921. And Canna Cabana, the lowest prices on cannabis. Guaranteed. Over 100 stores across the country. Learn more at cannacabana.com. Joining me this week, making her Toronto Mike debut, woo, is Reshmi Nair. Hello. Thank you for having me. Welcome, Reshmi. It feels great to be here in no, your basement. Amazing that you're here. You were literally on the air on uh, on your dial at 1010. You were on the air at like six o'clock, I guess. And here you are like 45 minutes later, which is amazing. Two to six, Monday to Friday, and I'm ready to keep talking. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, do your friends call you Resh? Like is Resh a nickname a friend of yours might use? Oh, great first question. Uh, oh. Growing up, I only let my older brother call me Resh. So when friends in elementary school would do it, I'd punch them and say, you're not allowed to call me Resh. Right in the nose. Okay. So people have to call you Resh me. Yeah. You can call me Resh now. I'm older. Oh, okay. <laughs> and my, my brother's lost the title. I would think uh, if I were a Reshmi, and I'm not, but if I were, I would want to be Resh. Like to me, that would be like if I'm a Michael and I want to be Mike, I would want to be Resh for what it's worth. Okay, cool. You can call me Resh, Mike. <laughs> I can call you Resh. Just don't call me late for dinner. By the way, you're leaving here with, since I mentioned dinner, you're leaving here with a frozen lasagna from Palma Pasta. Mm, I just want you to know that. So thank you, you. You're taking that home with you. What, what neck of the woods... In this uh, city or GTA, what neck of the woods do you live in? I'm in Leslieville. Okay. I love it. I was there for a concert. I was at, where was I? I was at the History. 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 You know this new music venue, History? <laughs> yeah. Like, that, Queen and Coxwell? Yeah, that's what Drake opened up, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. so you went to it. I was there event. Saturday night. How was it? It was great because I saw, I saw Moist and Tea Party. The Tea Party. What? And it was like... I was back in the 90s where yeah. I belong, so I had a good time. But oh, uh, David Usher. Yeah, well, you know, he still looks good. I believe it. Was, <laughs> I believe it. He was it. a hottie, and he's still a hottie, so there's hope for all of us, I think. <laughs> if here, you but. look like David Usher. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so you're from East End. I always wonder which neck of the woods people are calling home. Yeah, I, yeah, Leslieville has been home uh, since I moved back to Toronto, well, 09-ish. I was at Bathurst and Queens Key near the public broadcaster when I was working there. Sure. And then sure. I was in Parkdale for a brief moment. Uh, my dog was finding needles everywhere, so I had to get out of Parkdale. A little sketchy, but uh, I kind of dig the character of Parkdale, but oh, you're yeah. right, it's a little sketchy. Queen West is so nice for all of the different kinds of food that you can find around the world. Uh, but then I found a home in 2011 uh, in the East End, and, and I just love the East and End. And you're no longer homeless. You've got a home now. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why I said that. Uh, I was... In Scarborough today, and I only say that like that, like what big deal, you know? That's whatever six boroughs, like that's a part of Toronto, Mike. Except I almost never get to Scarborough because I like to go everywhere on bike, and Scarborough's so far away, like I rarely have time. But today, because I had a couple of cancellations, I carved out this chunk of time to make. Believe it or not, I'm an old man. This is my first ride to the Scarborough Bluffs. I did that today, ever first time yeah, seeing like, ever. Them? Yeah, I had never been in person in that Scarborough. Bluffs Park or whatever at the beach there with all the bluffs. This today was the first time I was there. What'd you make of it? No, I, I dug it. It was beautiful and I took some great photos and it was a great ride. It was a 67 kilometer round trip and felt good. And uh, it's funny, my hair, I'm st my hair's still wet because I said, oh, I just had a long ride. I have to clean myself up before Reshmi Nair. Uh, Nair, two syllables. <laughs> 
Because I want to say nair, but it's nair. Say nair. Nair. Just call me whatever you want. You don't care. It's not a big deal. I noticed some ink. How many tattoos do you have? Oh, or is that too personal? Many. Uh, my arms are covered. You know, I, I just don't think I ever knew this. Like, because uh, on television, we oh, don't yeah. see it, right? No, you would never see it. Uh, like, this is my first time seeing the ink. Yeah, so I've got, a, I've got some tattoos on, on this arm. Like a tree of life. Wow. I, I, I got different tattoos at different times. I think the total would be But there's be words on this side. Like, what is that? This is a letter from my dad. Oh, my God. Yeah, so when he passed away. He died suddenly from a heart attack, 2010. So I just took all the letters yeah. that we wrote to each other when I lived See, in Vancouver. See, I dig that. And, uh, and I got a letter and got some stars. I've okay. got, yeah, maybe like seven, eight, nine. <laughs> Do you have any ink? No. I think I'm going to be the, the last inkless man. Uh, I don't have any ink. But I do notice because I'm out on the waterfront trail every day and I see, you know, people are wearing shorts and t-shirts and a lot of skin. Like I did notice that there's more people with ink, I think, than without ink. Like I'm always seeing something on the calf or something when I see cyclists. Like I always wonder, why don't I have something on my calf? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. No, and now the next generation's just putting them on their face. Oh, that, but they're just taking it one step further. Like, well, all my parents are tatted. What am I going to do? That's rebellious and different. I'm just going to put stuff okay, on my but face. You did it smart. Like uh, I always remember a quote from uh, Brian Setzer from Stray Cats and he said, as long as you can cover your tats when you're wearing a suit and you're in front of the judge, he says, you're all good. Like, so <laughs> nothing on the neck or face or hands, a suit has to cover your ink. Yeah, I, it's a good rule. I got stars on my forearm and I was a radio reporter and my father lost it saying, you'll never be on TV now. Well, and that's I a said, good point. You don't like, need my arms to so show in order for me to get a job in TV. Would, and I know I know we're going to talk because you're on the radio right now, but you were on TV. I think of you as a TV star. So when you're on television, do they care? Like, do they ask you to cover it up or do they care about the ink? Oh, absolutely. They would care. Uh, no one's ever asked me to cover it up, but okay. I would never present myself as a journalist on camera with tattoos. But why not be the cool journalist who has tattoos? Like that could be you. You're Rashmi Nair. Now I'm screwing up your last name because I think it's one syllable, but it's two. Okay. Oh, you, you can say one it. syllable. Yeah. Rashmi is Nair. the tattooed journalist. Yeah. Like that could be your thing. You're the cool uh, chick. I don't think anybody wants to have a thing. I don't think you want to be a thing. I don't want to be but a thing. But it's not a thing you faked. It's a real thing. Like, it's not like you're Yeah, but the tattoos are thing. my thing. They're mine. And so you're seeing okay. them now. It's a beautiful, hot day. But when I get to work, when I'm in studio, when I'm presenting something, I think on camera, I don't want to see them. people's tattoos. Okay, I hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Because <laughs> there are more private spots you could have put those tattoos if you were really worried about people seeing them. Right? Yeah, no, of course. You want <laughs> tattoos to show when you're showing them, but right. when you're professionally presenting on air, it's not, it's not in my interest because right. look, this is a letter from my dad. Well, I'm going to say that, that is beautiful. Like that's a very personal, beautiful, uh, thing you did there on your right arm. Like I think like, oh my God, like, I, I mean that if anything happened to somebody I loved, that's exactly what I would want to do. I'd want to like ink myself. Yeah, with their, their... And when you get tattoos, you want to talk about them. It's like, right. I can't, I don't understand those people who are like, don't like ask me about my tattoos. You, right? Yeah, yeah, because. Don't ask me. It's like, of course, ask me. But when I'm telling you the news around the world, do you right. want to ask me about my tattoos? No. I hear you. I hear you. And I, I mean, you must have given each tattoo a great deal of thought, right? Because you're thinking this is for life and you have a lot of life ahead of you. So you didn't just... You didn't get, you know, see something and do it spontaneously. I'm guessing you gave this great thought before you got inked. Am yeah. I right? Yeah, you should put a lot of thought into it. <laughs> I, I, I would hope so. Okay. But then also, uh, you know, no no judgments on anyone who makes mistakes. No judgments. Okay, good, good. Uh, by the way, I have some lovely notes for you before we get into this. Uh, before we crack our first Great Lakes beer and have a nice convo. I recently had a woman you may know. Her name is Amber Pay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we love Amber Pay. Okay, because Amber Pay got very excited. I think I, we, we had just booked this appearance when I was talking. And she's in like Arizona. Arizona? Yeah, 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 Arizona. Like we were Zooming. She she didn't get a fresh craft beer from Great Lakes here. But uh, I just mentioned who was coming up. And I said, Rush me there. And she like lit up and said, BFFs. Like she's very excited to, I guess you guys are buddies. Oh, I'm so lucky to be in her orbit. She is outstanding, isn't she? So you've only met her virtually. Have you been no, in I've the never same been, room no, no, as no, Amber no. Pay? Only twice. She's been on two Zooms because she was on episode 1050, which I had a bunch of chum, 1050 chum vet, veterans, is what I call them? Veterans on. And we were talking about the history of 1050 chum. And she was on that Zoom. So I met her there. And then I invited her for her own episode, much like you're experiencing right now. And then she came back, but both times via Zoom. 
tell me about being like in the same room as Amber Oh, Payne. she is a breath of fresh air. And really, genuinely, it was when I was working at the public broadcaster that she came in as a, a fill-in traffic reporter. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so she just... For wa- like here and now. Oh, yeah. yeah and right. she walked into the studio. Boom. Sunshine right in your face. <sighs> positive energy. I have seen her have low moments and she still stays high. She's just high on life and it's contagious. It's inspiring. I miss her so much just talking about her. Uh, you got to laugh at life and she'll find the laughter in anything. Now, you're not rooting against her marriage or anything. I feel like if, if her marriage didn't work out, she'd be back here. Oh, Dion is amazing. Is he? Dion is amazing. <laughs> he flies planes, so I figure he's got to be a cool guy. And he's, he's an like... incredible cook. I've been blessed <laughs> with the food that he makes. My right. goodness, he makes her a better person. She makes him a better person. And everybody knows I'm just kidding. I'm rooting for Amber and Dion. <laughs> Dion, okay, yeah. like like Marcel Dion. I like that. Okay. But I'm not done yet with the notes. Like Amber Pay, excited you're coming on. Someone named Jay Michaels. We might know him better as <laughs> Mad Dog, but Mad Dog says a wonderful human and a massive Oasis fan. Mm-hmm. She's tops in my book. <laughs> Ask her about her conversation with Noel about eBay. So lots to unpack there, but firstly, how do you know Jay Michaels? Oh, Jay Michaels, I know from News Talk 1010. He is an incredible person as well. You know, of the same ilk as Amber Pay. Genuine person, right. big heart, finds the laughter in anything. And these are people who are very important to our industry. Truly, you need But we lost that him. He's attitude. in Montreal now. We've lost him in this market. Yeah, that's true, but they're blessed over there in They're Montreal. lucky, we're unlucky. I will say, uh, unlike Amber, who I've only met on Zoom, Jay has actually been here not once, not twice, but three times he sat in that seat. Oh, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. <laughs> and you and Jay have something in common. There's not, my ma- my brain tells me there's only four maybe and then some fill-in people, but you're in an exclusive club of like rush hosts, right? Yeah. <laughs> like <this> yeah. <laughs> because we'll get to all this later, but uh, Jay Michaels and Ryan Doyle came here when they launched Rush, like to announce, hey, we have a new show. It's called Rush. And now you you and uh, FOTM Scott MacArthur are the co-hosts of Rush. So we're going to talk about Rush later. Can you tell me about Oasis and this conversation <laughs> with Noel about eBay? Yeah, uh, I'm just a huge Oasis fan. I, I don't know what the eBay part is, but I was telling Jay <laughs> that I uh, I was just obsessed with much music as well. So oh, I me really too. love that I work in that building. I was at CP24 for about a year before moving over to News Talk 1010. And it's all the same company. It's an amazing building to be in. But when I would fill in uh, with Jay on the rush, I would just talk about how I loved being in 299. And I was this teenager who took the subway down to 299 to see any rock star at any moment. I was out wow. there getting autographs and all the rest of it. Just obsessed. Noel Gallagher, yes. very obsessed with. Um, I'd seen him a few times. Never saw Liam. Jay knows that. It grinds but, uh, Liam me. seems like a bit of a dink. Oh, but I wish I like saw Like good Liam singer, Gallagher. handsome guy, but I feel like he's a bit of a dink where I feel Noel, like he writes the songs. He's a bit more of the, the soulful songwriter, poet guy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I feel like we're back in the 90s again, but damn, Liam is so hot. And so I get into much music this one time that Noel Gallagher is going to be interviewed by Bill Wilichka and they sit, me and my friend, on this ledge and they're filling, you know, they're filling the space in the area for the interview. The environment. Uh, Oasis fans drove me nuts because they were all just yapping away for hours about all of these different theories as to why Noel wrote any of the lyrics. None of them ever make sense. That is the conclusion in 2022. Every (laughs) Oasis fan will agree. Thank you. Uh, But they were arguing over this Yeah, what is a champagne supernova, right? Like that's been haunting me for years. (laughs) What is a champagne supernova? Well, this was a B-side song that they couldn't figure out. And so during the live interview, uh, I I interrupted Bill Wilichka's interview with with Noel Gallagher because I had chatted with him during the commercial break about the song. Confirmed, this is pre-journalism, them too, but confirmed that what they were all gossiping about wasn't true. Got got it straight wow. from the source. Felt pretty. And you're good only about a that. teenager. Yeah, just in high. Supposed to be in high school. And uh, and then during the live interview, Bill Wilichka said, "Well, when are you going to come back? Because they weren't in town for a show. Noel just happened to be in Toronto. He said, "Oh, we'll come back in May." I said, "Oh, when in May? My birthday's in May." And he said, "Yeah, mine too. When's your birthday?" And we just started talking about our birthdays in May. Right. And Bill Wilichka has just given me the cut eye. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> no eBay talk? What's, what's Jay Michaels talking what the about? the eBay part is. Oh, well, maybe. Okay, fine. Another story about Noel Gallagher. 102.1 The Edge. Yeah. When it was on Young Street. 
Yeah, right? yeah, street the young, studio. yeah, they were they were at the like an in center there. Yeah, Noel's shooter there. Young, I think. Yeah. yeah, young and shooter, and uh, I have mm. a Union Jack guitar from the Champagne Supernova video that Noel Gallagher plays. Really? They only made a few of them in the world, and a friend who worked at a guitar shop in Streetsville <sighs> got it for me. I paid full price, but I got that autograph by Noel Gallagher, and he took okay. his sweet time it- to sign it. I'm and gl- he I'm said, "I'm glad you have all night. This is good. Keep going." Because he he signs yeah. it, and he says. Now, don't sell it until I'm dead. <laughs> and so I still have it. So that might be the eBay. Don't sell okay, the guitar on eBay, eBay until he's okay, dead. Okay, so shout out to Streetsville, okay? And uh, Billy Talent from yeah, Streetsville. Yes. And also the guy from Billy Talent worked at the Edge, just to tie it all together. Yes. I know, that's my job. I tied it Why don't together. I know him? We should be friends. <laughs> Ben, and then a Polish last name. I can't even... I think I have trouble with mm-hmm. Nair. Imagine my trouble with Kowalczewicz. I can't say it. They used to play the Masonic Lodge in Streetsville. That's, that's so what, are you that's from Streetsville? Ah. You seem passionate about Streetsville. Uh, are you yeah. a Mississauga girl? And then I go, ugh. No, I, I grew up in Rexdale. Okay. I love Rexdale. Home of Strombo. Proud to say that I grew up there. Yeah, he went to Humber. Uh, I moved from Rexdale in the middle of high school. So okay. I spent the last uh, four years in Streetsville. And so uh, Streetsville is the place where I spent the least amount of time, but it was quite remarkable. Well, why does Streetsville get, like, why does that neighborhood get sort of pushed like it's a city? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's Mississauga. But we talk about Streetsville like it's somehow it's unto its own self. Like, it's a standalone geographical region. We don't do that with other Mississauga neighborhoods, really. We don't really talk about Port Credit. We talk about, we, I mean, maybe Port Credit's the closest example to what I'm talking about. But what is it about Streetsville that makes it so special? So along the credit, there is a house in Streetsville that Timothy Street lived in. And there was a man named Timothy Street who founded Streetsville. And My that house is, is still there. And wow. so there is a Queen Street in Streetsville in the wow. town of Timothy Street. And it has a really cute uh, storefront strip where um, some of the oldest buildings can be found. I hope oh, no, it still it's stays there. I hope it stays there. Yeah. And the small businesses there are incredible. I still go to Streetsville to Savannah Salon to get my hair done. I've been going there since I was okay. 15. And I know at least, uh, I'm going to shout out an FOTM, okay? Dale Cadeau. Uh, Dale Cadeau, I believe, from Streetsville, now lives in BC, but I wanted to shout him out. Hey, did I mention BC? Okay, because I got another note from somebody who was here recently. His name is Mike Hannafin. Oh, Hanny. Love that guy. Hanif- Hannafin, uh, living the life I want to live where he's always like hiking or biking or something. I'm like, why <laughs> does Mike get to do that? And I want to do that. Okay, maybe one day, but okay. Heard you mention Reshmi Nair is booked for July. I worked with Reshmi at News 1130 in Vancouver when I moved there. She was early in her career and we became great friends. First time working with her, we went downtown at 4 a.m. to report on a stabbing or shooting or something outside a nightclub. In interviewing an elderly lady standing in front of her house, the only person who knew what happened, Reshmi and I also collaborated on a story ripped oil line in aftermath that won a journalism award yeah edward r murrow award yeah we won uh the best spot news coverage for a burnaby uh, a ruptured pipeline in burnaby yeah it was wild uh i've learned so much from mike hannafin and it's people like mike hannafin that has made the next generation of broadcasters i owe a lot to that man he is patient and funny and wicked smart and knows everything about every phase of this industry and is willing to help and encourage. And you don't run into many of those either. I love this list. I know. It's like, you didn't know you were coming here to hear about people's uh, thinking you're actually fantastic. And these great I'm, humans. You wouldn't Thank know it from the, the, the tweets, but we'll get to that later. Okay. But Mike Hannafin's <laughs> first, I think it's fine. We'll get to that later. We'll, we'll, we'll cover it <laughs> uh, civilly here. the but. tweets later. <laughs> Oh, man, I get attacked on Twitter all the time. I can only imagine what happens to you. Okay, Mike Hannafin, uh, I think his first job in like media was he was hired by Fred Patterson to help with sports on CFNY. Mm-hmm. So I'm just tying all these you know bows together here. Fun fact, I actually now, right now, I produce the Humble and Fred podcast. So look at how everything will connect during our conversation. That's today. amazing. And I grew up with Humble and Fred on the edge. Yeah, because they were there to 01, uh, yeah. 2001. And uh, I, by the way, I did miss, it doesn't matter, but I, I had you pegged as younger than you are based on the fact <laughs> you seem to know the 90s alt rock that I'm talking about. And I, I did, I have you, it doesn't matter how I'm old 41. you are. I'm 41. Okay, so I had you a little younger. How old are you, Mike? 
40, what am I, 48 as of last week, so 48. I can't ride my bike to the bluffs. But you could if you trained a little. No, I'm no Mike Hannafin. <laughs> yeah, Hannafin <laughs> could do it. That's for you. Scott Turner could do it. Shout out to Scott Turner, who worked at the Edge as well. Okay, lots of ground to cover. Uh, right now, can we crack open a Great Lakes beer? Yeah, let's do but it. You got to do it on the mic. So, okay, I, okay. I know you probably don't drink on the air at 1010, but... I'm usually cracking open a, a Coke Zero <laughs> if you ever hear the can. Okay. Well, you should do beer. So, yeah, don't wreck those nails. You want me to help you? No, I got okay. it. Oh, okay. But you you want it on the mic. Yeah, even though you are blowing it. But try anyway. <laughs> Go ahead, on the I'm mic. I'm blowing it already? You, you blew it because I heard it. Yeah, it's it's okay. Well, you're drinking a lager from Great Lakes Beer. I'm drinking a Sunnyside IPA. Hold on. See, that's how you do it, Reshmi. Oh, that's professional. I, I have lots of practice. Yeah, cheers. Here, we'll do a real cheers. Okay, Reshmi there. This is going to be a good time. Delicious. Uh, Thank you, Great Lakes, for sending over the beer. You're going to take some home with you, Reshmi. And uh, I already thanked Palma Pasta. But really quickly, I'm, there's a toque there. You don't need it right now, but hold on to it because it will get cold again. And that's courtesy of Canna Cabana. Do you smoke weed, Reshmi Nair? Unbeatable. Uh, I do enjoy CBD. I have endometriosis, which is an uncomfortable mm. condition for anyone with a uterus. And uh, I found that CBD is, is the only thing that helps. So shout out to Canna Cabana. There's over 100 locations across the country. Won't be undersold on cannabis or cannabis accessories. You've got a toque from Canna Cabana. Thank you. Hey Refs 88 wants to know, how was the trip to PEI? I did not go. I did not go. Okay, my... so can you give me a little, like, forgive me. Uh, you were supposed to go to Prince Edward Island. On the 30th. Yeah, so planned this Canada Day long weekend. I have a six-year-old son who's named Lachlan, which means from the land of lakes. Hello, wow, Great Lakes okay. Brewery. Shout out Great Lakes. And I Shout was supposed Lachlan. to take him uh, to Terminal 1 at Pearson Thursday, 9 p.m., which is already a late flight for a six, six-year-old, but I wanted to make the most of the long weekend. Get to the island, have yep. all day Friday, Saturday, and then fly back Sunday morning. Well, the 9 p.m. flight gets delayed. And D delayed or canceled? Delayed. Okay. Because I have a story when you're done your story. I have a story. Yeah. And then it's delayed by another hour. And 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 my fear was that if it goes past midnight, it's going to be canceled because there are um there are limitations, right? There are curfews actually for oh. gates and flights and runways. Okay. So it did take off at 11 p.m., but I was on my way to my trailer near Wasaga Beach with my six-year-old instead of getting on that plane because there was no way. I, I was live on air from two to six on that Thursday. Yeah. But I woke up that morning and my former colleague, Gian, Gian Lee from CB24 was live at Terminal One Pearson first thing in the morning. I wake up, turn the TV on and she's saying, it's a mess. <laughs> I was like, why would I do this? And then I spent the entire day saying, why would I do this? Essentially what it boiled down to, Mike, is as a journalist, I would be standing at Terminal One, putting a mic in any parent's Ugh. face with a child who has stood in the same place for hours and said, why do you need to be here? I have a great story for you. Related to what you just des described there. Okay, so I actually have a six-year-old as well. So we have something in common. You have there. four kids. Four kids, yes. Is I have six a, the youngest? Yes. Six is the final because uh, I no longer uh, can make babies because I had a vasectomy. So it's all over now. Congratulations. Actually, it's all over. That's Thank the real you. kind of birth control that's, we should be talking that's about. That's the real talk. Yeah, well, that's right. Uh, that's exactly, you know, time to be the responsible one here. Let me get this done. Okay, so... <laughs> We once kicked out the vasectomy jams on an episode of Pandemic Friday. People can dig that. It was quite something. Okay. Where am I going with this? Oh, yeah. So two of my children, I have four, but two of my children have a Lolo and a Lola in Edmonton, Alberta. You with me here? Okay. So now that school's out, uh, my wife and these two little ones had a flight from Pearson to Edmonton on Saturday morning. Okay. So I wake up. I'm going to drive them to YYZ. An email arrives and my wife's, my wife gets an email. This is like about an hour before we're leaving to go to the airport so they can go to see Lolo and Lola in Edmonton. Flight's canceled. Like the flight was just canceled. And then they said, oh, but we can put you on our next flight Thursday. Okay. They're, so this is all, this is a two week adventure that's all been planned. Anyway, the flight was canceled and we weren't shocked because we see the news and we see what's going on at Pearson and they're canceling lots of flights. Anyway, what we ended up doing is the next next morning, they flew out of, uh, where did they fly out of? The Waterloo Airport. Oh, so huh. Waterloo Regional Airport has flights going to Edmonton. And so they did get to Edmonton. They're there right now. and they But they got there the next morning. 
very early flight, but fine, we worked it out. So the six-year-old and eight-year-old are there. But yeah, uh, Pearson's a clusterfuck right now. Like, I'm glad I'm not going anywhere right now. Uh, this is why I bike everywhere. It sounds like it'd be horrible to have to travel right now. There was a dog left in a crate oh, I heard that. for more than 20 hours. Right. Because the woman who landed right. had two dogs and she only got one and she landed shortly after midnight and she's walking around there until 3 a.m. looking for someone to help her find her dog. And the staff at the airport said, go home, call your airline, find your dog. So she left without wow. one of her two dogs, wow. only to find out later that it's been in a crate this whole time, wow. covered in its own urine. Yeah, I can imagine. That's, uh, I that's, mean, that's also terrible. how I, I, I also think that the people stuck on the tarmac at Pearson Terminal 1 feel like that dog. Because you can get on the plane, but it doesn't mean the plane's going to move. You could be stuck on the tarmac for hours. A friend of mine was trying to travel with her kid today to get to Vancouver Island. Right. Uh, a couple I know over the weekend went to Brooklyn for a wedding. Both flights canceled in the same scenario as your wife and your kids. Canceled. And that, that's all you get. Okay, well, we got to rebook you. And the convenience of this, the customer service experience is gone. On Thursday, June 30th, I called Air Canada after six o'clock to say, yeah. let me just get on the line and cancel this flight. It's going to be easier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm hearing. We played the voicemail yeah. on the show today on The okay. Rush on Newstalk 1010 Toronto because when you call Air Canada, there's a recording in English and French saying, sorry, there's no one here to help you. Please <laughs> use our self-service tools online. Pretty much just saying you are SOL. You're fucked. And we are not available to hear how effed you are. Like We're wow. just not available. We're wow. not available. Uh, it's a mess. I don't blame anybody and I blame everybody. But but someone has to be accountable. Like, is this just a the, the fact that everything had to shut down for a pandemic and then all these bodies haven't, re they haven't replaced the bodies? Like, and then now they're back at full schedule without the resources to make it happen? Like, is this simply... Well, there's no authority that says, hey, let's start slow. Nobody wanted to wear that. Hey guys, let's start slow. If you have a car that's been sitting in your garage for two years and you start it, do you blast it to 120 and just r let it rip? You should start slow. Right. And I don't think anyone on any level of government or any kind of authority was going to say that to an airline that was right. trying to book as many seats as they could. Whew. Wow. Okay. So we have, so it's funny. You, you were going to PEI. That's where you were going straight, like to Charlottetown or something. You were flying to Charlottetown. Yeah. Is that the plan? Okay. Yeah. And it didn't happen, obviously. Cause I did get a tweet. I said you were coming up on Monday and somebody said, I hope she's back from Nova Scotia by then. <laughs> and, I, and I actually didn't reply. I didn't know what we were talking about. Like, well, well she booked this for 7 PM. I'm, I'm hoping she's back or whatever, but uh, I guess that was just lost in translation. Yeah. No, yeah, I knew that we had this booked for Monday. There was no way I was going to be stranded in Atlantic Canada, Mike. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad you're here, and I'm sorry you didn't get the PI, but it sounds like you have a trailer in Wasega Beach, which, uh, why are you going to PI anyways? You got a uh, trailer yeah, in Wasega Beach. I bought Beach, into so. it with a friend of mine in 2020. Okay. She said, you want to buy a trailer? And I take my son camping every year, but yeah. during the pandemic, camping Where do you camp? was Balsam Lake. Okay. It's a great place for kids. Super shallow for miles and miles and miles. See, that's why we go to uh, the Pinery. Oh, yeah, I've heard the Pinery. Because the same reason you said is the kids like it because it's like Wasego without the crowds. Like you can just go in the forever uh, in these beautiful sandy beaches. Like yeah, Wasaga Beach. I mean, I wouldn't really go in the water with Lachlan that much, but Balsam Lake, it's just, you know, it's it's ankle deep for us for forever. So you could be on the beach and the kids in the water and you're not too worried. And this is your only child, this uh, Lachlan. Yeah. He is my only child. And so camping was something that we always did. But camping during the pandemic turned out to be a bit of a challenge. I mean, oh. sometimes bathrooms may not be open. And so, hey, going in on a trailer uh, with my best friend was a great idea because it was somewhere we can go, have a fire, be outdoors. No, I'm jealous, uh, to be quite honest with you. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I mean, although I did camp during the pandemic, but uh, they had re weird rules. Like you had to be masked up and only two people in the bathroom at a time and all this stuff. But yeah. once you were camping, I think we all decided to, to just uh, ignore the rules anyways. But uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Did I say that out loud? Okay. So tell me, uh, it sounds like you were already a journalist as a teenager because you're cracking the case with uh, Oasis and that's pretty cool. But when did you say, oh, I'm going to do this for real? Oh, great question. I, I was born this way. I was just born this way. Well, like Lady um, Gaga. But I uh, moved to Vancouver uh, when I was 22 and I was a career barista at that point. I was just working in coffee shops for the majority of my life at that point. And I was quite happy doing that. Might have opened a coffee shop myself at some point. But um, 
had regular customers at a coffee shop saying, hey, you got a great voice for radio. And I was like, I really do want to do radio. And uh, it, it's just always who you know. So uh, I was also part-timing at the only Swiss Chalet in Vancouver on Broadway. And There's only one? Yeah. I don't even know if that one's there anymore. Oh, I didn't know that. But I was training a young guy on packaging delivery, and he turned out to be the son of Carrie Marshall, who is no longer with us. Carrie Marshall did the news on Jack FM in Vancouver, okay. um, and he was great. So this guy said, hey, you got to meet my uncle if you want to do radio. He's Carrie Marshall. Carrie Marshall. Carrie Marshall let me shadow him. I sat in in a Jack FM studio in Vancouver, also on Broadway Avenue, and just fell in love with it. Just sat there saying, yeah, of course, this is what I want to do. I've always listened to the radio. I was a big fan of The Edge when I was a kid. Right. And never really thought that um, I could be a DJ. I mean, I wanted to interview rock stars all the time, but you know, those breaks. You in want a Strombo's songs. job is what you want. No, I cannot be Strombo. I'm a huge fan <laughs> of Radio Strombo. Radio Strombo, uh, we grew up on. Uh, he's he's a genius. I loved his breaks in between songs. So which Strombo don't you like? Because there's a, there's a few different Strombos, but you like the Radio Strombo. And I mean, he was on the edge for I many guess I years. say Radio Strombo because I don't mean much music Strombo. You don't, you don't care for much music Still Strombo. Still loved and supported much music Strombo because I was a Radio Strombo fan. So I was all gung-ho for him to succeed in anything and everything that he's ever done. Hockey Night in Canada. Also, I think he would put a question mark there. But I love George Wasn't Strombo. a good fit for him. He, Hockey Night in Canada, Strombo. Yeah, I mean, I think they should have found the fit for him. I, I think he is a fit in his own in his own right. And so find the right fit, make the right fit for him, for sure. You know, Strombo's start in radio is at uh, the, the Fan 590 because he was BFFs with Bob Makowitz Jr., still is, Mackle and FOTM, by the way. And Mackle's dad was the program director on 590. And they got a night show called The the Game. I'm going to call it The Game. And Jeff Merrick's in on that, too. Yeah. Oh, also a great guy. Yeah, they were like the three of them working on The Game, like overnights, figuring it all out. And then eventually Strombo, I think it was Stu Myers, brought him over to uh, to The Edge. And the rest is history. Yeah. I remember one break, he talked about how you get your song on the radio. And I just sat there listening to it. It's like, this is the greatest advice ever. Here's how you get your song on the radio. Uh, but yeah, you learn so much from him. But I couldn't do those breaks in between songs. Hey, here's something funny and odd and weird. And now here's the next song. Uh, but when I got into broadcasting, it was more um, news-based. I was just Well, as we learned from news. Mike Hannafin, you were at News 1130. Yeah. Great station. Would have stayed there forever, but the maximum pay was $40,000. And that did not cover my rent in Vancouver. So I <laughs> left to roll the teleprompter at CTVBC oh. for $65,000 a year. Can you imagine that? You're uh, We are award-winning radio reporters making forty. dollars No, I'm, I'm, fa I'm totally fascinated by salaries of seemingly like famous Canadian media personalities. And so you're telling me... I'm trying to think of the equivalent here would be 680. Is this like a 680 in Vancouver? Yeah, 680. It's, it's, it's a sister station, sister News station, 1130. Right. News 1130. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so, so we win the Edward reporter there room. was paying $40,000. Yeah, and and my boss was amazing. Jackie Donaldson is a huge giant in radio broadcasting. I owe her everything. But she said to me, congratulations, you won an Edward Murrow Award. Don't ask me for any more money. Wow. And so it, it was a struggle, but she totally understood when I moved over to TV. But I was a writer and a teleprompter roller. And I was making more money wow. doing that. And I, I I gave up reporting for a heartbeat there in order to just pay my rent in Vancouver. And that's just what the industry's like. Yeah, and again, this is a few years ago or whatever. I mean, we're going back, I don't know, 15 years or something? I've oh, lost. yeah. Yeah, so, okay. But uh, not that you have to tell me an exact number, but a reporter today, uh, similar, similar type of uh, c compare, right? Like, I mean, obviously... It's it's a it's an important job, and we need great reporters. But it doesn't sound like companies are willing to compensate great reporters. I really hope that we create more full time jobs in this industry. What I've seen um, in the wave behind me is freelancing everywhere, right. and it doesn't help anything. It doesn't help. It's a survival technique. I see the need for it and the necessity of it, but it doesn't work for anyone. The newsrooms suffer and the journalists suffer. And that's the the uh, benefit to a big corporation with a freelance. Is it just simply that they, 
you're not like on the payroll and you don't have to be uh, given like uh, health insurance and dental and all that kind of stuff. So well, it goes it's to exactly, you go. yeah, it goes exactly to what you're saying, right? Like you would hope that we pay reporters enough money to do their job. And with that comes some certainty that you are doing this job Monday to Friday for at least a certain period of time, because then you can think ahead and you right. can plan and you can search for stories and you can build relationships. Right. Freelancers, and I know these really incredible journalists who do all of that work without getting paid, and then they pitch the story. And you pitch the story per word or whatever right. it is, and you get paid a few hundred dollars. But the legwork that goes into all of that research isn't covered with an hourly rate. That's unfortunate. Uh, that's unfortunate because uh, these companies that own these big these stations, again, I'm not from your industries, so I can I feel I can take equal, but these are they make a lot of money. These cable companies that own these stations, like there's no shortage of uh, revenue at the end of the uh, fiscal year. I think every employer <laughs> makes a lot of money, right? That's how they can employ people. Wow. Okay. That's why we got to start a cable company, Reshmi. That's what we got to <laughs> do. Okay. Well, we don't want to get you in trouble right off the bat here. Okay. So, uh, you're when what brings you back here? Now I know. I guess, so, so you're in Vancouver, what, like 04 to 08? Is that when you're in Vancouver? I was in Vancouver 2002 to 09. Yeah, 09, okay. I moved back because my dad asked me to. Okay, yeah. and uh, we already learned off the top from your ink that your dad's no longer with us. Yeah, yeah, I moved back April 2009 and he died suddenly July 2010. So I had uh, one year, I had one year with him. We had a Christmas, we I'm had birthdays. Sorry. Thanks, it was tough, but follow your instincts, instincts. I would highly encourage parents to tell their children what they want and need. And I would highly encourage children to follow through in what their parents want and need. It's a two-way street. But I'm, I'm grateful for that time when he said, it would be great if you lived closer. And I took it as a, I love you and you should live here. And that was Streetsville. Or, he was, yeah, okay. yeah, he was in Streetsville. Yeah, came home for a visit. And uh, I was lucky enough to be a reporter at CTVBC, so I emailed the the team here at 401 in McCowan, uh, CTV, CTV um, headquarters, and they were great. They gave me a tour. We talked about opportunities, and I was able to move back in a few months. So CTV has been really great to me, my career, my family. But you didn't stick around too long that time because uh, you went to CBC pretty shortly thereafter, right? Within that year. Yeah, April 09, I moved back and uh, CTV Toronto is still the number one newscast, the most watched local newscast in the country. And they deserve that. They're an amazing team there still. Uh, some of the people who I worked with back then in 09 have moved up the ladder and they're doing great work there now. Uh, but yeah, I was... Uh, able to cover the strike of 09. That's when garbage bags were piling up everywhere. Oh, I was I at Christie Pitts where okay. the a hockey rink was being filled with garbage bags. My memory of that is ATN Brulee Park. Do you know this on the Humber River here in the West End? But I remember in the, the yeah, piled up in the, the parking lot was basically oh, just gosh. garbage. Yeah, yeah. And so I was covering Christie Pitts and uh, I got an email from a CBC producer. They said, hey, we're putting together a new show. We like your attitude do you want to, do you want to look into you this had, further? Did they go, we well, have spunk kid. I had some attitude. <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, that should have been the first sign to run, but I <gasps> told my dad, which was another mistake because then immigrant, uh, hockey night in Canada, the national, all the things of the public broadcaster right. came to the top of my dad's head. And I, I said to him that, you know, CTV has been great for me and they've been offering me all of these great opportunities. And he just cut me off and said, I don't know what you're talking about with contracts and compensation and all this. I just know that I immigrated to this country and I want my daughter on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Oh. So I took the job. He says, that's where Beachcombers aired. That's where you belong, <laughs> right? Relic and the gang. Okay. So I took the job and then he dropped dead from a heart attack. And then there I was at oh, CBC. And he, I, I'm just resisting the urge to give a shout out to Ridley Funeral Home because it seems inappropriate when you're, you're no, go. Well, well, I noticed okay. that when you were going through your sponsors, <laughs> I, I was like, when's Ridley going to get a shout out here? Okay. Let me say it this way then. Brad Jones, who's the funeral director at Ridley Funeral Home. They're really good people. They're, they really are pillars of this community since 1921. But he's got a pot. 1920. Yeah. 1921. Yeah. Yes, that's right. 1921, not 2021, because that's right. Tw 1921. But he's got a podcast called Life's Undertaking, which uh, I proudly produce, but it's really strong. Like, Brad's, a, he's got a great podcast kind of about life and death, and uh, it's really thoughtful. And I urge people to check it out. I think you'll dig it. It's called Life's Undertaking with Brad Jones at Ridley Funeral Home. 
Okay, so you take the job at CBC because a new Canadian like your father uh, sees CBC, uh, the, the national broadcaster, as the pinnacle. But I can see that. I would think, I would think that might be... That, I mean, am I wrong? I was born here. I was born in Parkdale, by the way. But isn't CBC that sort? Isn't that the pinnacle? I mean, I'm not no disrespect to CTV, but I would think that would be a, a good place to hang your hat for a good long time. Am I crazy? It was for a show called Connect with Mark Kelly that was canceled after two and a half years. So it was risky going into it that I was going to be leaving a company that's been really great to me and I was getting incredible opportunities to then join um, a public broadcaster where I didn't know what the show was or what it was going to become or how long it would survive. And it was short lived my time at CTV Toronto and I would have appreciated that to have been extended but that's why I'm back with Bell Media, because for 10 years at CBC, it was an incredible time. It was an incredible time, Mike. Yes, to your point, it is a privilege to work for CBC. And that is what I said to everyone on my way out. It is a privilege. And everyone who yeah. works there should keep that in mind every single day, because I did. And I know other people who work there who felt like outsiders did that too. They walked in, you walk in and it's an incredible feeling because of all of the things I said, hockey night in Canada and the national and all the rest of it. But yeah. also you feel the potential of the future and it's amazing. I don't regret a single day that I spent there, but I did spend every single day there thinking what my career at CTV could have been like had I stayed. So after 10 years of getting everything that I could out of CBC and the incredible experiences and the incredible people there too, who taught me um, things that I wouldn't have learned on my own. Uh, I, I said after 10 years that I would like to go back to the company that my heart has been with from this whole time. Okay. So let me understand. So you're at the uh, public broadcaster, as you call it for 10 years and you, you made a phone call. Like you basically went and talked to somebody at CTV and just asked if there was any opportunities there. I've suggested this to other CBCers. If you stick your head out, if you just stick your head out the window, and I think some people don't realize that in the industry, yeah. if you just stick your head out the window, it's surprising the attention you'll get coming back. But, but, but you're speaking as Reshmi Nair. Like, I happen to think, and again, uh, people might think I say this to every guest, and it's not true. Go listen to every episode. I actually don't say this to every guest. But I think you're, you're very you're very strong. Like, you're excellent. Like, I'm, but we'll get to this later when we, we get you to 10.10. But... Not everybody's going to have the experience you have. Like you're a desired asset. I said asset, not ass. <laughs> no, I, okay. I, uh, I I I appreciate that characterization. Uh, it's it's overwhelming and hard to believe. But maybe it's because I spent ten years <laughs> in a work environment where it's hard to believe. It's it's um it's a really great place. And I think with every employment, and we're seeing that as the generations continue, that you don't stay with a company for a lifetime, because eventually you just don't feel appreciated by that same company. And I think people should move from different newsrooms, at least to strengthen your own journalism. You should not work in the same newsroom for your entire life. I have shared this with many people in the industry because it you put on as many hats as you put on, you find those different versions of you as well. Interesting. I just had, I think, Two weeks ago, uh, Wendy Mesley made her Toronto Mike debut. I listened to that. And she was 41 years. I think I got the right number, but you know, that's, that's your lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. she was there for 41 years. Uh, no, now, now, and now she's podcasting with uh, Maureen Holloway. But th there, there's somebody who got comfy and uh, stuck around. So, I mean, the end was not very comfortable for her. No, no, the the end was not comfortable at all. It sounded it sounded terrible. But uh, so you can sit and wait for an end, right? Or you can find your new beginnings. Is this like Batman? What is they said? Either you die a a hero, or you live long enough to become the villain. <laughs> oh, right. That's the Wendy Mesley story, <laughs> that, right? I think that, I think that might just be the public broadcaster story. No. And, I, and I say public broadcaster because I don't want to just keep saying CBC. It could be okay. BBC. It could be other crown right. corporations in other parts of the world. I think public broadcasters have their certain way. I, I hope it ends well. Here's what I wish because I think he's very good as well. I hope it ends well for Ian Hanomansing because I think he's uh, excellent as well. I always saw him as the uh, heir apparent to, the, to Peter Mansbridge there on the... Uh, the National. So what do you think happened there? 
Well, they did the four-headed monster. <laughs> I shouldn't call it that. But they, they so post Peter Man's Bridge, and Peter's also an FOTM, and swears to me he left of his own accord. So I believe him. He says, no, he wanted to, I guess, get out by the time he was 60 or whatever the age was. I can't remember what the age was anymore. But he, so he just It like, wasn't 60. Was it 60? <laughs> 70? Was it 70? I don't know. I think he was counting elections. <laughs> I think he was counting elections. I think I heard him saying, this is I'm my last BFFs election. BFFs of his wife, okay? I just want, as, as close as you are to your BFFs, you know, with Amber Pay, I'm BFFs of Cynthia Dale, who uh, we've become very tight here. I feel like I can, uh, I can, I can say these things about Peter now. But okay, so whatever year that was, by a 70, I guess it was by his 70th birthday, he wanted to be out. And I think he left when he was 69. Maybe that's the number, the right number. But bottom, where am I going with this? Oh yeah, Ian Hanamansi. So they brought in the, ne- I didn't think, it, I, I, I should point out, I'm a CBC guy. Like that's typically what I watch. So I follow this stuff pretty closely, whereas somebody will say, oh, there's a person at CTV, like an anchor, a reporter you should have on. And I'm always at the Google them. Like, who are we talking about? Because I never see it. No disrespect to the wonderful people. Uh, Dana Levinson's a good example. Uh, Dana left after 19 years and I sent her a note or something because somebody said you should have Dana Levinson on. She was there 19 years. So I Google her. I didn't know. I never saw her on TV in my life. Now she's, I, I see her a lot now, but. Uh, Dana's had, CTV. Yeah. Yeah. What okay. did I say? Yeah. Yeah. I'm at CTV. Now, okay. I guess. So, so CTV is the one I'm unfamiliar with. Like CBC, I know. Okay. So the CBC, I'll get it back to CBC. I'll get back on track here. Here, It's a, it's a Monday night. I'm having a good beer here. Dana Levinson, also a great human. And I produce her podcast on the DL. Oh, and she's wow. become a dear friend. Oh. And her husband and I share a birthday. Oh um, my gosh. That is our connection there. Shout out to Dana Levinson. Shout out to Dana. <laughs> so CBC replaces Peter Mansbridge with the four people. I never, I felt it never worked. I, I don't know where they all are now. I think we're down to Adrienne Arsenault. She's now the only host of the national, right? Which is what they probably should have done right away if they weren't going to hand it off to Ian Hanomancing, who I thought would have been great, by the way. But the whole four headed, the whole four host thing doesn't, I don't think it works. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. But I, it didn't seem to work for me. And then obviously they agreed at some point because they dismantled it. And now we're down to one. So I don't know. Ian still has, you know, he, he does that cross Canada checkup. and Cross country checkup. Yeah. That is fun. the best show. <laughs> that is the, and I'm so happy that he is at the helm of cross country checkup. I've been lucky enough to fill in on that show. Mm. It was one of the best days I've had at CBC because you're connecting with Canadians across the country. Sure. Uh, the topics are fascinating. You hear great stories and you feel as Canadian. Indiana as possible. And Ian Hanamansing is an incredible but human. Do you, in my opinion is he's underutilized at the uh, public broadcaster. Agreed. I feel he's underutilized, but you might be as well. We'll get to that in a minute. You're not at the public broadcaster, but okay. So, so, so why did you, you, you just felt like you should be in another newsroom. You should change things up. You wanted to go back to city, sorry, CTV. Like what is the, uh, is that the spark that says I'm going to leave CBC now after 10 years? I stuck my head out the window. Uh, I had but my you could get son... hit by something. Like it could be a bird or something. <laughs> I had my son in 2016. Like Fabio, you remember that? When yeah, he was what? on a roller coaster? Fabio was hit by a bird? <laughs> yeah. He was on a roller coaster. And a bird smacked him right in the nose and uh, <laughs> broke his nose. Yeah, I'm not making that up. But go ahead. <laughs> it was so surprised by the stunning handsomeness of Fabio. Uh, that would have been me if I saw Liam Gallagher, just for the record. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I had my son. I came back from maternity leave, and I'm going to be totally honest. I returned, mm-hmm. and they had offered, a new manager had offered me a job in radio, And so nine years of my contract being renewed at the same amount, all of a sudden, after three months of doing radio, I get pulled into the office of this new manager and he says, so we have to renegotiate your contract because you're in radio, not TV. And they wanted to cut my salary by a significant chunk of money. Well, fuck that. I would leave on principle. I would go live under a bridge before I signed for, uh, with that. That's unfair. It was. And now, I'm, now I'm glad you left. And, well, it was unfair. You have my full support. I don't know where he is now, but I went above him because for three meetings, I tried to explain to him the optics of cutting the salary of a full-time staffer who just returned from maternity leave. And only after three months of doing this radio gig told that I was not allowed to receive the same pay that I was getting as it's a, a TV person. a bombshell because I'm still processing it. That's so fucked up. Like you, you go off for your parental leave. Because, you know, we don't call it maternity leave anymore. I don't know if you know that. But you, you go off to do oh, that. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And then you come back. Yeah. And they're like, we're going to move you to radio. Oh, and by the way, your salary is No, we're going to move you to radio. 
And then after three months of doing radio and oh. getting how many paychecks did I get? Six paychecks of the same salary that I had before I went on Your parental TV leave. salary. Yeah. And then only after. That's a bait and switch. That's a black and white bait and switch. That's amateur hour. We, we expect better from the public broadcaster. Well, the manager above him had no idea. And the person who handles the contracts had no idea. And my contract was renewed just as it should have been without him even realizing. And, and I honestly just stopped going to his meetings. And he didn't come to my desk to say, hey, let's talk about this. Because right. that's how it works there. You lost respect for him. I just didn't see the conversation going any further. And the last time I had a conversation with him, I said, I hope you understand that I'm going to have to elevate this discussion because I'm not getting through to you. So I will be speaking to your supervisors about this. And I just walked out of the office. Sorry, you had to go through that. That's, that sucks. Um, okay, what were you, remind me what you were doing on the radio. I should know this, but tell me. Oh, no, no. So when I came back from mat leave, I was doing these uh, 90 second newscasts on morning radio. It was uh, a new, uh, it was a new newscast. I mean, I'm sure it's still going on the FM dial. So you would have been listening to CBC Music, uh, the morning show, not a morning show, just CBC Music. And then I would come in with the news inserts and okay. write the news, read the news. But hey, I just and said- And that's you if, being underutilized at yeah, but I said, uh, but Yeah, but when it was like, well, we'd, we can't pay you what we paid you to be on CBC News Network, I said, okay, well, then just put me back on CBC News Network. Like, I'm here for the job. Right. I am here to get paid. I'm not right. here to lose money after having a baby. So how do I keep making the same money? Give me that job. Right. It shouldn't have been that difficult. So you stuck your head out the window- and stuck. no one can blame you for doing that. When stuck you stuck in, no window. bird hit you because instead uh, you found out there was an opportunity outside the uh, CBC. I, I, I really encourage everyone in the industry. And I think that managers should be more aware of that too, that people should keep talking, making those network connections and seeing what opportunities are out there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I reached out to Bell Media to see if there was anything out there. And this is the this is January 2020. So a few months before the world would come to a standstill. None of us knew that. But I, yeah, I, I resigned a week before March 10th, before the pandemic hit. Before oh my God. It was declared. Your, yeah, your, your timing's week. impeccable. Okay. So what were you, and I, I kind of know, cause I have a piece of audio. I'll, if you're okay, I'll play a bit of it, but what were you hired to do at CTV? No, oh, hit the audio, hit the audio. Okay. So it's a bit, okay. I'll see how much to play of it here, but here, and it, because it's uh, in a CTV player, which I don't, anyways, let me see if this plays. Bear with me here. Rush me. You this should is, watch not, CTV uh, news. I appreciate that you go to the public broadcaster the for your news. Welcome, Randy. Great to see you. Ben, how are you, sir? I am good. Okay, so uh, tell me. It's, it's Ben Mulroney, Quibi. everybody. Yes. Tell yeah. me about Quibi. So Quibi is, stands for Quick Bites, mm. which is essentially short form content exclusively for mobile phones. Not for your TV screen, okay. not for your computer screen, okay. for mobile phones. Specific. Okay, so, and Bell CEO Mirko Bibic and, and Quibi founder Jeffrey Katzenberg, which is a huge name, yeah. they sat down with BNN Bloomberg's Amanda Lang to talk about this partnership between Bell Media and Quibi. Why don't we take a listen? Sure. I mean, they have made incredible stories, beautiful things that have been produced for this that I think people are going to be wowed by. It's mobile, it's convenient, it's on the go. And so you have the best content and you deliver it the way consumers want to consume the content, and that's, that's the match. So you got the platform and you've got Bell. How are we working together? So uh, Jeffrey came up a year ago and showed us this incredible content, Ben, and we said, look, we have to be your partner in Canada. So Bell Mobility, Bell Media, you know, Merco, as you just saw, has really said to the company, let's embrace this because it's a marriage of tech and content. I got to ask, though, uh, I mean, the people are consuming so much content on their phones already, on their mobile devices already. How is this going to be different? Well, how it's different is that Jeffrey Katzenberg is a genius. Yeah. And he has gone to every Hollywood studio, Ben, and said to the Hollywood studios, they're all owners of this. Yeah. And also, he's gone to every producer and every director and every actor and said, by the way, you can own your own content on Quibi. 
And I'm looking at some of the names. We've got names like Jennifer Lopez, Chrissy Teigen, Liam Hemsworth. I mean, this is at launch. All right, I'll bring There's her down now. This is, goes so for a bit here. But evening on Quibi. Let's see, CTV from 7 to I almost to forgot about Quibi. Quick qu bites. <laughs> Quick bites, okay. You were, uh, that was your, you were tasked to be like a, a Quibi host. Tell me how you're involved with, you were involved with Quibi. It was very exciting. And again, this is before a global pandemic was declared. Uh, but yeah, it was Jeffrey Katzenberg, who is DreamWorks, a very big name. And that big name, I think, created a lot of confidence in the longevity of this project. And CTV got the contract with Katzenberg and Quibi, as did BBC in the UK. So okay. CTV in Canada... BBC in the UK and NBC in the US would be the three news outlets providing content. So every movie or TV show is edited in five minute increments. So you just watch them in little quick bites. Uh, we would have newscasts where you would just get a five minute newscast and it would bring you up to speed. There was one in the morning and one in the evening. And you're the face of this. Yeah. And Heather Butts, who's still with CTV. We love Heather Butts. She came from the East Coast. Uh, she's here at CTV at uh, 401 in McCowan, Channel 9 Court. She was the host of uh, CTV News on Quibi in the daytime, and I was on in the night. So uh, what the fuck happened with Quibi? Like, is it is it all the fault of the pandemic? What exactly happened? I feel, I feel as a guy who just observed this, and once a month, Wise, Mark Weisblock comes over and we dive deep into everything that happens. So we cover this pretty uh, intensely, but... I feel like marketing classes are going to use Quibi as some kind of case study because it didn't last very long. There was a lot of money poured into it. Of course, no fault of your own, but this thing was over shortly after it began. Yeah, and they would say that it's uh, a symptom of the pandemic. Jeffrey Katzenberg, to answer your question as to what happened to Quibi, uh, the genius, Jeffrey Katzenberg, pulled out. He pulled his investment out sooner rather than later, if only to keep his investors happy and to pull the plug on the productions that were underway. It was difficult for us. I am still really good friends with our Quibi team, CTV News Quibi okay. team. Uh, we endured and survived and created incredible content. And I'm, I'm proud of the work that we did. If I can brag, one of our editors from Quibi is now at CP24, and he builds incredible stories on Instagram and YouTube that you can watch on your handheld phone. So the skills, tools, and ideas that came out of our CTV Quibi team still exists and survives and is showcased on different platforms still. So Quibi, yes, it didn't last long. I am absolutely proud to be part of it. Uh, I said to my peers in the industry that I have no regrets because, like I said, stick your head out the window, believe in yourself, and take on as many projects as you can. Try on different hats. We still do need some sort of a news source on your phone. We get the notifications, we get the buzzes, we get the articles, but a handheld newscast is something that I do think we're lacking, and Katzenberg and Quibi were ahead on that front, but their platform was also more for TV and movies. So what we did as CTV mm -hmm. was great. And I still think that we're going to be able to find ways to make what we thought about, imagined, and almost created a reality. I heard in that clip with Ben Mulrooney and Randy Lennox there, this uh, marriage of content and technology is what they talked about, you know? And I feel like you're right. The content, fine. I feel the problem was the technology. Like, People didn't want a standalone separate app for this. Like people are already, uh, you know, YouTube's a juggernaut, as you know. And then you mentioned Instagram and there's, uh, um, there's so many that were places people are already going. So focus on the content and then put it, put it where people already live. Well, Quibi would have been competing with Netflix, right? So if you're right, in right. the grocery store lineup or if you're waiting for your dentist or your doctor, which mm -hmm. none of this was happening in March, 2020 when we True. launched, uh, but the assumption was you would be, and you can watch something in a few minutes without missing right. th the moment. Quick bites. Yeah. I mean, there was a Steven Spielberg film on there and you could watch it or you could just watch it in its entirety. And it doesn't feel like you're watching five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. You could watch the whole thing or you could stop it and be able to consume it in ways that worked in your in your life. That's TV and film. The news part 
I thought was quite successful. I, I think it's, I still think it's a great idea. If you are um, waiting in line anywhere, waiting for a streetcar, pull up your phone, get a full newscast from someone who you trust from a right. team that's working hard. And the thing that I want to point out with our Quibi newscasts, especially that mm-hmm. we're starting to see on social media is we, we were putting graphics on the screen. That is new. Being able to being able to read words on a screen with clips moving, hear the sound, you could watch it with audio or without, and you wouldn't miss a thing. But why not just take that content and deliver it via YouTube, for example? Uh, that is a great question. That's above my pay grade. I think newsrooms are trying to figure out how to stream and still make money. And as a journalist at CBC, uh, at the age that I'm at, Oh yeah, in my 30s, I was like, why isn't this on YouTube? Why isn't this on? And the response that I would get is, we don't make money off of that. And we have to explain to our TV advertisers For your ad rolls, right, why we're have, streaming right. online. Yeah, Because Bell Media sells ads that roll through the CTV player. Yeah. Like you, need, you need to be in the CTV. I'm just, that clip I just played, for example, you know, that's yeah. in the CTV player. If once you move it to YouTube, you can't uh, dynamically insert ad rolls. No. And then if you, I mean, I don't, you know how YouTube works better than I do, but I'm sure if you get a certain amount of hits, then maybe you start collecting oh, it's revenue. It's a lot though. It's a lot. It's a yeah. Lot. And so can newsrooms do that? Can they start no, you, taking you would, money you would def- from YouTube? No, you're right. You're right. So this becomes one of those great uh, boardroom discussions, where, which is what, what is more important, the eyeballs or, you know, the, 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 the value per eyeball, if you will. Although most people have two. I have to do the math on that, but okay. We're still behind. <laughs> Newsrooms need to figure out how to get online and we're behind on that. So what does uh, Bell Media do with the great Reshmi Nair when Quibi dies that uh, premature death? I was lucky enough to be embraced by CP24. So I moved over to CP24 in November, November 2021. Yeah, and we launched a, a show called CP24 Tonight, which is still in its existence in, in some form or another. So you see, you see, Mike, there was Connect with Mark Kelly, Quibi, CB24 tonight. And we're not done yet because, uh, you know, although I did, I will just say, I saw on your LinkedIn page, you were an internal CTV news ombuds person. And I just want to ask you what the hell that means. Yeah, this is a really important position that I think. So Wendy Freeman, the former president of CTV News, created the position if only to have that conduit for discussions that staffers have, and that includes freelancers, mm-hmm. uh, that may not need an HR investigation or a supervisor or a manager to look into. Maybe you feel like an issue came up in an editorial meeting and you want to talk about it, but if you flag it to your boss, you're not going to be called back for another shift. Those kinds of scenarios make people feel uncomfortable in flagging any concerns. So just as internal ombudsperson, they can come to me and say, hey, I got this issue about this, that, or whatever. And then I would take it up to any higher ups if it was an issue that needed to be dealt with. Okay, because one thing we, well, people should know this anyways, but we've definitely learned is that uh, HR, for example, works for the company. Like this is to, you know, t- to mitigate risk for the company. Like HR doesn't work for the employee person who's yeah so so are you suggesting that like the ombudsperson i've often heard about the cbc ombudsperson and stuff but i never really thought too long on what the hell they were doing but you're somebody that if someone's got an issue at in the workplace they can talk to you instead of hr and then that is different than going to the place that represents ownership okay i mean and and then i'm asking this in sort of in the uh like just following this John Derringer situation and everything that's come out of that. And we're hearing from people like Jennifer Valentine and Maureen Holloway. Maureen Holloway was on that show, Wendy Mesley, Mm -hmm. telling me about the files that Chorus has about her complaints about John Derringer. These files sit there. And, you know, and Jen Valentine talked about, you know, this went up to the CEO and they said, oh, is he still doing that? And then, of course, nothing happened. But please tell me about you. Absolutely. So in that scenario, uh, you would have a group of employees, likely female, uncomfortable with their work environment, and then at some point feeling like flagging it led to nowhere, right? Correct. So then what do you do? So if there was an internal ombudsperson in that environment, Mm -hmm. uh, and if it was me, then I would sit with anyone who had issues, and it would be informal, and it would be off the record, and we would all have a discussion, decide how do we flag this, what are the issues, who do we go to, and there's strength in numbers, right? So I think in that scenario, it might have been that each individual had a case. 
also, and I don't know their scenario at all, but Mm -hmm. I do know in other environments, if you do show up together, a united front can appear as aggressive. And so then managers might try to reprimand you all for coming in together or disperse you and say, your issue is separate from your issue and your issue is separate from your issue. Well, the internal ombudsperson was created in 2020 when we had this reckoning of anti-black racism. There was also bodies of children found on residential schools. And so there were concerns among black employees, indigenous employees, and just allies asking what is going on with mainstream media and how we cover stories. So can we cover them with balance, uh, with sensitivities? Can we cover them with people who have a lived experience as opposed to a spokesperson? And so when people have those questions, then I can bring those to editorial discussions and then we can make it work out without having an Indigenous freelancer being the token spokesperson for all Indigenous people fighting management and trying to get their point across. It it sounds like Chorus could have used an ombuds person. Uh, And I'm thinking of Supriya Devetti, who I... Thank you, Steve Pakin, for informing me. You don't say the W in Devetti. Uh, I was saying Duavetti, and you don't say the W in Duavetti. It's Devetti. But, uh, it's you know, she. it sounds like they really could have benefited from an ombudsperson at Chorus. I think most people who uh, have lived experiences that don't match their in-work environment, and in this industry especially, don't match the stories that we cover, uh, we just get used to not bringing that part of our life to work. And in the last five, six, seven years, we've been encouraged to do that. So there's a bit of a clash in that we have Palestinians in this country asking us about our coverage of Palestinian issues. And why can't we say Palestine in our graphics on the screen, right? And that is a legitimate discussion that we should keep having. And that's only happening in 2022 because we have Palestinian Canadians who are bringing that lived experience to the conversation. It has clout and it carries weight. And and I think those kinds of discussions will turn the dial in, in the right direction for society. I have a question here from Andrew Ward, who's a listener of the program, always submits good questions. He wants to know what was the transition like between working in public versus private broadcasting? So because you go, you had 10 years, even though you were at CTV before that, but you had 10 years at CBC and now you're at uh, in Bell, with Bell Media what was the transition like between those two uh, environments? It's different. It's it's different in, in many ways. Um, I would say uh, the public broadcaster is um, slower at things. And that's not a, a slight, but they are uh, methodical in their coverage to the point where sometimes you're banging your head on the wall because you know the story's up and left. And it's been 24 hours and we're only getting to it now. And that pace is something that's hard for um, people like me <laughs> named Reshmi. Right. Uh, and <laughs> and I would say, though, that also to be able to have the years that I had under my belt um, and, and also the incredible experiences for my colleagues there, it helped me um, just smooth back in with 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 ctv i mean everybody's been really great and yeah it's it's not different but it is i know that's a terrible answer um it's like you know you always go to the one grocery store like maybe you always go to loblaws and then one day you go to sobeys right everything looks the same and it feels the same but you know you're in a different place right no yeah no doubt no doubt now suddenly you, you can't find any president's choice products so <laughs> what are you gonna do i just i know that feeling well i couldn't have had a coffee at a news conference working at cbc and, and that is me being extremely stubborn because I'm sure other people have. But when you work for the public broadcaster, you are not, I shouldn't, I would not have had this can of beer in my hand. I would have not accepted the toque that you gave oh, me. Oh, yes. This is like from the uh, Amanda Lang, whose name we heard earlier in this episode, by the way. I heard her talking on that clip about Quibi. But yes, uh, you're right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know I can tell you this because I've had several CBC people on the program from like Tom Harrington to Diana Swain to uh, Jill Deacon to Dwight Drummond to uh, Matt Galloway. And they all got to clear it like there's a whole clearance process or whatever. They all get approved because why wouldn't you approve a visit to Toronto Mike? But they do have to go through this uh, process. And it, it seems like that got ramped up uh, in the aftermath of the Amanda Lang. Did situation. they take your beer and lasagna? <laughs> yeah. Gasp. 
Okay, well, I'm totally comfortable in oh, saying... I say that because I, I don't, think they did. I don't want to s- get anyone in trouble. They I might don't not think have, I would have been approved. If management's listening, if management's listening... I don't think I, I would have been did. approved. I don't think I would have been approved. So you... Uh, you, it's, you it's, but it's but different no, they would have allowed you to come on, but then you would have politely declined the beer and the lasagna is what you would have done, right? Yeah, sure. But See, I, now I, am, I, I, I actually legit like don't want to get anyone in trouble, and it's... Maybe Tom Harrington did decline. I don't want to get anyone in trouble. So, uh, <laughs> I feel bad for my these good FOTMs who just come in for the real talk. But they've all they were all great guests. And when the CBC people come on, I I have a uh, 1976 vintage 1976 CBC shirt. It's highly flammable, but it was worn during the uh, Olympics in Montreal. And I, I donawn that whenever a CBC person comes on. So you don't get that because you're at CTV. Okay. So I oh by the way this shirt. From Dewar, D-U-E-R, Comfortable AF. And I just want to urge FOTMs that uh, to save 15% at Dewar, which has the world's most comfortable pants and shorts. And I'm going to throw shirts in there because I love their I love their shirts. So damn comfortable. You can go to Dewar.ca, D-U-E-R.ca, or you can go to their retail store on Queen Street. Just use the promo code Toronto Mike. That's an order. Use the promo code Toronto Mike. Let them know you heard about them on uh, Toronto Mike, and you save 15% when you do that. So it's a good deal for everybody. Thank you, Doer. And quickly, just to, so I don't forget, and I didn't, when I talked about Ridley Funeral Home, I didn't tell you, Reshmi, you're getting uh, measuring tape. You, you, you never know when you have to measure something. What, am I going to measure myself for a coffin? You never know. <laughs> that's the They're thing. giving out that's measuring the- tapes from a funeral home? Ridley. You never know. Right? You never know when you have to measure something, right? I'm just going to measure myself shrinking. Insert joke here. No, this is great. Measuring tapes are very important. You never know. There's there's so many jokes. I'm overwhelmed, but okay. Are they in Etobicoke? They're here, yeah, in New Toronto. They're at uh, Lakeshore and 14th. So you can drop by and say hi to the good people at Ridley Funeral Home. There's a sticker from stickeru.com. So that uh, I can't wait to find out where that ends up. And by the way, I would be honored if you were to bring that to your local tattoo parlor and say, I'd like (laughs) I'd like a Toronto Mike tattoo. (laughs) So just throwing it out there. You're going to have to drop dead. That's usually what happens. My tattoos are for people who have died. Well, I'll whatever it takes. (laughs) Shout out to Ridley Funeral Home. I'll do what it takes here. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm uh, happy to. Now, I got to get you to 1010 here because otherwise you really will be spending the night. Uh, It depends. Some people i will tell you some people stick it you know the best place is the the bumper of the car that you drive but you know if you're i don't know i'm thinking alan cross because you talked about the edge he's got a garbage can in his office and i'm on the side of his garbage can in his office and i'm just honored to be anywhere to be honest so just let me know where it ends up like tweet at me or whatever oh that is huge. let me know where it ends that up is huge. oh and find out Scotty Mac, find out where he put his Toronto Mike sticker because he's been here and he got a sticker. So find out where the heck that is hiding. Okay, speaking of Scotty Mac, Mm -hmm. how did this come to be? Like, I need to know you're at CP24 and I'm, this is again, I got to be careful because everybody jumps and everything, but you look like you should be on TV to me. Like you're a TV star. Oh no. I'm wrong. I appreciate you thinking that I should be on TV. I don't know what that means, Mike. Is that... I don't know what it means. Why did the CBC pay more for the TV people than the radio people? Tell me that. Tell me that. I couldn't tell you. It doesn't make any sense. Because there's a communication part. There's a visual part. Uh... You know, anyway, I, the more I talk about it, the more I'll get in trouble. But I think I think of you as a TV star. You're on CP24. I saw you on CP24 doing a great job. Did you want to go into radio or did yes. they tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, we have an opportunity we want to talk to you about? How did this come to be that you ended up at 1010? I have been lucky enough uh, to be a fill-in host there. Um, so in January 2020, when I stuck my head out the window, it was many platforms of Bell Media and I was trying to pitch different things. And 1010 was definitely on my radar. I was having coffee with the program director at the time as many times as I could uh, mm-hmm. just to get in there. So yeah, no, I, I wanted to return to radio because I had a really great time filling in on CBC radio for a few years there. And I wanted to keep that momentum going. I'd started in radio when I was in my 20s. Your heart's in radio, it sounds like. Absolutely. You want to be on radio. Like, like Dr. Johnny Fever. 100%. Uh, Margot Harper, shout out to her. She was great. Uh, she was the news director of CTVBC who just threw me on camera. I did not go to school for TV journalism, so I didn't know okay, what I was so doing. Okay, so I'm wrong here. I thought maybe 
I guess I'm used to people wanting to be on TV, maybe because the salaries are higher. I legit am a brown girl who wants to be on the radio, Mike. And in 2022, I finally got the job. No, really. Radio managers saw no worth in having diverse people on the radio for a good chunk of time there. And I didn't understand. And I, I and I, I hear what you're saying, but if you really listen to what we're saying, we're mm-hmm. saying racialized women should be on camera. What does that mean? Oh, you would be a waste on the radio. What does that mean? Well, just voice- that I didn't quite say it that way, but I hear what you're saying. You're saying that we can, you can see diversity. You can't hear it. But you can. You can Tune in. It. Tune into the rush. <laughs> Two to six, Monday to huh. Friday. You will hear diversity because it's our lived experience. And that's one part that I feel really great about at this stage because the Supriyas of the world have made it easier. Uh, the Ian Hannah Mansings, who are hosting Cross Country Checkup now, right. are making it easier. And people like me who are younger, who are seeing these people on radio, can now see that maybe I can be on the radio as well. Radio was very white for a very long time. Super white, especially yeah. in this market. Yeah. And and when you ask why, nobody can explain it. But then when you look at TV and it's so diverse, you have to ask why. Why did we put more effort into balancing out a fair representation of this city on camera, but not in audio? And I think that we're trying to catch up to that now. Uh, I probably could have stayed in Vancouver radio. There are racialized people on radio out west, but I came home and I was grateful for all of the opportunities on camera. But being live on air on camera is very different than being live on air on the radio. And I was born to be on the radio. See, this is this is why I'm so glad you're here. Like to to, to hear you tell I can hear by the way you're talking that your passion is in radio. You wanted to be in radio. It sounds like you I know that Ben Dixon's long gone, but it sounds like you let the powers that be know that you're uh, keen for an opportunity in radio. Yeah, he was great to me. He was great to me. Good to hear. Good to hear. And uh I guess It sounds, and again, I know you can't speak to any of this because uh, you weren't involved, none of your business, et cetera. I saw the tweet earlier today (laughs) where somebody was going to asking you all these personnel questions that, uh, not personal questions, but personnel questions that you simply had nothing to do with. But I mentioned off the top that when the rush was launched on 1010 CFRB, we now call it News Talk 1010. Toronto. In Toronto, right. When it was launched, that Ryan Doyle and Jay Michaels came here and they sat there and we talked about this new show called The Rush. So uh, Ryan Doyle left the show. I think Jim Richards was filling in. And then Jay Michaels, it sounds like he got an offer he couldn't refuse to do morning radio in Montreal at (laughs) Shom. I hope I said that right. I've been practicing. Can you imagine him saying it? Shom. He would love it. He would like yoga or whatever. (laughs) That's where it comes from, right? Shom. Show. Okay, so he got the offer. He couldn't refuse to go to Montreal. Uh, one of the questions that I know the Gordster had all these questions. He wanted to know where's Ryan Doyle? What happened to Jim Richards? Uh, I will say of all his questions, I actually know the answer to all of them. Uh, but the one I actually don't know the answer to, the one that seems like a mystery to me as a guy who just observes what's going on in Toronto and Canadian media is I actually am clueless as to what ha- where, what's going on with... Um, <laughs> Huh. Jim Richards. So I have no idea. Like, I actually don't know if Jim Richards works there anymore. I have no idea. And I, I, if you don't know, that's your answer. You don't know. But I'm going to ask you, do you know what's going on with Jim Richards? My answer is go straight to the source. As a journalist would advise, go straight to the source. Anyone who's tweeting that question, send Jim a question. Send Ryan a question. They are accessible human beings. If they want to address your question, they will. And if they want to put out a statement or have some sort of an answer, they will. And from my gauge, they haven't. So that's as far as Ryan's made comments, but Jay has been uh, radio silent on this issue. So uh, uh, not Jay, uh, Jim. Sorry, Jim. too many Jays. Yeah. I have two boys. They both have Jay names and I mix them up. What the are their time. names? The oldest is James. James is 20. And the youngest is Jarvis. Oh, Jarvis. Two J's. Six yeah. years old. And, and the, the other they're, two kids' They're names? two J's, and then my daughters are M's, so I don't know if I was just like... Uh, what are their names? Okay, the oldest is Michelle, who took me to a Blue Jay game on Sunday for my birthday. Which Happy is, belated. So that's where I'm at. You have the six-year-old, okay? One day, that six-year-old is going to take you to a Jay's game or something, and you're going to be like, oh, like that's amazing. Like This person bought me tickets and is taking me to a game. <laughs> 
Like it's like, wow, because you know, I have a six year old too, so I can tell you. Morgan, okay, that's the other. So Michelle is the almost eighteen year old who's going to McGill next year. She's oh, moving to Montreal in August. That's it. she's just. She should listen to Shom. She'll be listening to the Mad Dog on <laughs> Shom. Shout out to Mad Dog. I don't think he goes by Mad Dog on Shom. <laughs> Bring back Mad Dog, Jay. Come on. And you know, Jay Michaels is a fake name. So he put a, he put a fake name on a fake name. That's double layer fake. Your it's name's real. It's the only thing fake about him. Your name's real. It's the only thing. My name is real. My name is just real. Just checking. Just checking. <laughs> they haven't asked you to change it to Rush Me. <laughs> no, no one said, hey, what about Rush Me? You know what's funny is when I started in radio, one of my broadcasting teachers said, you're going to have to take your nose ring out. And I said, what am I going to have to take my nose ring out? And he goes, well, if you want to be a journalist, you're not going to be able to broadcast with a nose ring. And I was in radio school. So I was like, this doesn't, this is nothing relevant. So you've had that nose ring since you were very young. I've worn this nose ring on TV doing the news. And any other brown person I think has it's said, cool. how do you get away with it? Yeah, sure. Except I think the hiring teams assume it's religious and oh. not cultural. Oh. So they just let it slide. But could a white girl with a nose ring read the news on CBC? No, but I don't know if they could, but they could, they could, they could have a winning streak on Jeopardy. With a no- <laughs> <laughs> no so. Matea Roach, I met her. Did you? Because I tried She's to get her on Toronto Mike and I didn't get any reply. Oh, I, I have uh, no loved her run. I loved her run. But yeah, you should reach out to her. Uh, she's connected I with the Walrus. I met her at the Walrus Gala. Okay, cool. Uh, she's a contributor for the Walrus. I think she wrote for them before. She no, I mean, had I, I'm a big, uh, big, big fan of Matea Roach for sure. Okay, so your nose ring, no one, no one is because they think it's religious. And I, okay, I a lot of ignorance here. Is there a religious thing of nose rings? No, I don't know these no, things. No, no. No, <laughs> it's just fashion. It's just fashion. But I didn't say anything. Okay. And, uh, and it, now that I'm, I'm just thinking of news readers and news presenters in this uh, country, there's no other nose rings out there? Yeah, Maybe there you go. Okay. So I wouldn't show my tattoos, but I wouldn't take <laughs> my nose ring out either. Um, but well, you can't cover that. What we were talking about. Oh, uh, yeah. My do- so just to wrap up the daughter thing. Morgan is the youngest. So uh, I can, my youngest, I can't imagine her like becoming this adult who's going to like buy tickets and take you somewhere or whatever. But then it happens. Like this is how it works. And it's like, oh, that, that just happened. I had the best time on Sundays. So I just want to say, I love you, Michelle. You're the best. Okay. So uh, where was I going with all of this? Should I just bring you back to 1010? Because I have more questions here. Go for so it. one question is, you were teamed, right? So Jay went out. To Montreal and now there's a there's a there's an opening for a new rush they need a new rush did you do a chemistry test with Scott MacArthur like was there anything where it says you guys go for lunch and see if you have good chemistry before we team you up on the radio yeah we went for walks he also lives in the east end and so we connected and we went for walks and I think a few minutes into hearing his booming voice and the Scott MacArthur you know on air is mm-hmm. the Scott MacArthur off air that, that is Scott MacArthur all the time. He's intense. I had a very pleasant experience with Scott. And even post, he, he recorded something for episode 1000. Like he, uh, I, I dig this guy. Yeah, yeah. He's intense. He's direct. Uh, he's an incredible storyteller. And he's booming. He just booms. Uh, that, that, that's what, like, my friends were like, what's your co-host like? I was like, he's a boomer. He just booms. Oh, you mean he's old? No, he's worth the same no, age. No, he's a Gen X he boomer. Just, he just, he, like, he just booms. When he walks into the room, he's booming. <laughs> I'm sorry, Scott. I didn't realize that was the word I was going to use for you. But yeah, we went for uh, some really great walks around the beach and... Was we that got to, to see each other? to see whether you'd be a good team? Like, is that was that before you accepted the gig or whatever? Like, I'm just trying to visualize. Like, oh, Bell, I, I Bell accepted Media, the gig. So no, you accepted the gig, 100 percent immediately. So, did you come first, and then they needed a co-host for you, and then they were thinking of Scott, and then you needed. So Jeff McDonald is yeah. the is the brains behind this, and he's incredible. And he offered me a job, and he offered Scott a job. I don't know the timeline okay. of when those jobs were offered, but I. 100% quickly said, yes, please. I would love this show. It's a dream job. Jeff McDonald said, think about it, Rashmi. And I said, no, I don't need to. So that's my side of the story. Because right, you wanted to be on the air at 1010. And this is an afternoon drive show. And you weren't going to get John Moore's job. So this was the next best spot. And I want John Moore to have his job. <laughs> I have a six-year-old no, I know. son. In radio, I need to get him to school. Morning radio oh. is the top of the mountain. And then afternoon drive is number two. Am yeah. I right? I'm good with number two forever and ever. <laughs> Amen. Because you don't have to wake up at 3.30 in the morning. Yeah, no, I got a son. I got to take him to school. Yeah, that's right. Um, Yeah. So uh, I, you know, it's a great question because I know I was 100% 
on board, like to the point where Jeff was saying, Rashmi, think about it. And I said, I don't no. have to think about it. So I did accept the job immediately in my head mm -hmm. when Scott and I went for a walk. I'm pretty sure the paperwork probably didn't go through until after a few of our walks. So did we walk before we decided? I mean, I guess like if the walks went terribly wrong, one of us would have gone back and reported back to Do you management. know how many times I've had someone on the show? who was teamed with somebody that there was no such chemistry test at all. Like they're, they're saying, you now have this as your co-host. And they were simply a mismatch or oil and water or didn't work well. And this show was a disaster. And I always, that's why I asked the question, because I, I, who have never worked in radio, don't understand why would you put two people on a show together without having, like the walks is a great idea, without having some opportunity to see whether, can you stand each other? Do you have good chemistry? Will this work? Like, I can't imagine teaming people up who have never, you know, spoken to each other uh, like that before. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. It's part of the job. You and I have never spoken before. How are we doing? Yeah, but we can fail. It's like, part of the we job. Can, we can fail. Well, it, yeah, sure. But if you fail, then you're not good at your job, Reshmi or Scott. Like, if Reshmi and Scott didn't get along on air, I, I don't want to be that person who says, this is oil and water, and now you have to find me. I'm oil, so find me more oil. Okay. Or I'm water, but you want to be. You water. also want to be happy at your job, right? I'm just saying, I'm saying, it's, well, it turns out you Your definition do of like happy is interesting. Well, even if, you know, oh. you know if we were adversarial and, you know. Yeah. Like, what you, if we hated each other? You, you wouldn't want to do this five days a week. You want to do this. What is it, two to six? What time are you yeah, on? Yeah, Monday to Friday, two to six. Like, would you want to talk to me from two to six, Monday to Friday, if we just, we just hated each other? I think it would make for great radio, Mike. <laughs> I think it would make for great radio. I am Fine, so I'll take Scott's job. grateful Fine. Scott is co-hosting The Rush. I'm so grateful. Right. We don't agree on some things. And I, I, I do want us to continue to disagree on issues. We come at things from different perspectives. Uh, we agree on things, I think, because we are of similar age and we have a better understanding of the world than some people who have other opinions on things. But the commonality can be boring. So right. I have worked with people I don't like. I have been on air co-hosting with people I don't like. And if you couldn't tell, then that's a reflection of <laughs> no, me doing I know. good No, I can I'm contradict my myself. Job. You're right. I, I guess I'm looking for, you know, people, you to enjoy your uh, four hours on the air at 1010 every day. And if you hated the person you were talking to, yes. Are you going back to Q107? <laughs> I feel like this is a story that I'm not a part of. But I, I, I feel you on that. If there are issues at the end of the day that aren't dealt with, right. then it's a problem. And again, this is all moot because uh, Scott's a sweetheart and you guys get along great. So this is all moot. He thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> I, I, I'm the one who gets mad. I'm, I, I lose it sometimes. Mark Weisblood, who will be here Thursday, tells me that Scott MacArthur says Reshmi once every 30 seconds. Uh, are you at all aware of this? And is this intentional? That I do what? Every 30 seconds? That Scott MacArthur will say your name every 30 seconds. <laughs> the name Reshmi. You know what? I'm probably scrolling on my phone or looking at the 10 screens or my mic is not on and he's probably getting my attention because he's a great co-host that way. <laughs> He's a wingman. He's like, and, and this and this and this, rush me. And then I hear my name and go, oh, yeah, what? What are we talking about here? <laughs> uh, I don't know why he says my name. I think to include me. He's very inclusive. Okay, and maybe. Do, and I, but I don't say Scott's name. Some friends have pointed this out. <laughs> so give me your advice here, Mike. Yeah. If Scott says my name every 30 seconds, should I reciprocate? Should I say Scott's yeah, name? Yeah, maybe if you reciprocated, he'd realize he's... Uh, He's, he's too frequent with the Reshmi shout outs and then maybe it would be, you know, I think at the beginning of a new show, you need to, it's like a soap opera, like where you, you, they say the names a lot, so you know the characters or whatever, but at this point, how long you guys been, how long have you guys had the rush now? Oh yeah, since April? Since April, right? So we're so talking in July like here. Months, you know, yeah. People know now it's uh, Scott this, MacArthur and Reshmi now. I'm doing this in the three month window of probationary <laughs> period. Is that what it is? When does your probation end? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to know. Uh, I, is, Jeff, is Jeff McDonald happy with the performance? I hope so. I hope so. Here, let me let me put him let's in. He's just, in the let's Zoom just call room. Him up let right me. Now. Yeah, <laughs> I like th that's a new thing I like to do. I like to surprise people with someone in the Zoom room. I just did this to Stu Stone. I had uh, Cynthia Dale in the Zoom room because Cynthia Dale played Stu Stone's mom in a movie called Heavenly Bodies from the mid '80s. Okay, so <laughs> Stu Stone was the kid, like six years old or something, and then the mom, and then I reunited them. Like I surprised Stu with this. I'm like. 
We have a missed anyways. I don't have Jeff oh, on, in the Zoom room. So don't worry. You can uh, stop sweating over there. But okay. Zoom room. Did Zoom room. When I saw the promotional photos for the new team at the, the Rush, Monday to Friday, 2 to 6 p.m., I couldn't help but notice that uh, FOTM Scott MacArthur had a uh, beautiful, lush, long hair. The flow. Does he still have that flow? Yes. Yes. And I am all for it. Uh, as you can see, I am also of the frizzy haired people. So I encourage Scott to keep that hair going. Yeah, he's shown me photos of him with shorter hair, equally handsome. I mean, the guy can pull off any look, but yeah, the flow is great. It's great. And, um, the, uh, another note from Andrew Ward real quick. Uh, what's the working culture and shift like in radio versus TV? So what is the big difference to you when you move from TV to ra to radio from television? We can talk about it. We can talk about it. It was frustrating to be on CB24, if only because we're so limited in timing. And that is a difference between TV and radio is that in TV, you want to have the entire topic summarized in what, a minute? And so when... Can you just read a script, right? Well, yeah, but you can you can work around it. Whatever shows up in the prompter, okay. I mean, your your mouth doesn't have to say the word. But you only you, there's only so you can only uh, yeah, you can stray only so off far of from the spirit of what's on that uh, teleprompter. Yeah, I mean, but like I mean, like try to encapsulate what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine in one minute, right? It's right. so hard, and then you assume that people might have been following along, but you don't know, so you got to reference and offer context, and context is key. So the evening program that still exists on CP24, CP24 Tonight, uh, we had segments with panels where they were seven to 10 minutes long, but still in TV time, yeah, seven to 10 minutes of a TV discussion is not getting into the weeds and the context like we can in our seven to eight minute segments on News Talk 1010 Toronto. You're just able to, uh, and I'm sure you've noticed this too with the podcast, is you're able to disarm people. Oh my God, yes. That's my secret. Don't but, tell anyone. <laughs> but when you bring people on camera, they're just sitting there blinking like a deer in headlights saying, I'm on camera right oh, now. Oh, no. I, sometimes right people now. are like, oh, that was 90 minutes. And I'm like, you know what? It, it takes a half an hour to get their trust and rapport and the guard to come down. And then all the good stuff comes after that half hour of, uh, you know. Halfway through this Great Lakes brewery. <laughs> because the, the, the real talk hasn't even started here. Okay. No. I, I Yeah. Don't worry. I won't keep you several hours. This isn't the, I just dropped this uh, episode 107.1, which is a retrospective on the 45 years of Q1. Okay, so it sounds like you were an edge listener. So you probably didn't listen to Q107. No, I still love Q107. And I know you have Jeff Woods coming up. Ah, Friday. Yeah, that's right. And, that's right. and so do you know Jeff Woods? He's been over a few times. Yeah, he's a he's a regular. So when I was a barista in Vancouver, okay. he worked in the Black Tower on Georgia Street in Vancouver. Right. And I was this <laughs> stupid little girl who was in radio <laughs> broadcasting school and Jeff Woods made time for me. He made time for me. I have all the time in the world for that human he's being. He's a good guy. He's an incredible guy. He's an incredible guy. And he's, uh, oh, he's just, he's amazing. I love you so much, Jeff Woods. He encouraged me and um, was really great in, in making me feel like I could do something in this industry. I just wish I could do Jeff's voice. I can't do it. I can't even fake oh, it. No, but you can't even. Uh, he's got, I think for my money, again, I've had a thousand people on these microphones, but the Jeff Woods voice might be my favorite of all the, uh, guests who've been on my mic. Uh, no disrespect to the current guest I have right now, but, uh, there's oh, only no, one Jeff, Jeff Woods. Woods. Oh, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. I hate my voice. I love Jeff Woods. Voice. So why do you hate your voice? <laughs> sounds good in my headphones. What do you hate about it? No, I, mean, I think everybody hates their own voice at some point. Except right? Jeff you Woods, just hear who goes, back. he listens to himself just on a continuous loop. He's, oh, like, he's oh. a perfectionist though. That's <laughs> <laughs> and he has perfected it. Way to go, perfect Jeff Woods. And he lives up near uh, Thornbury now. Yeah. And not too not too far from your trailer, if hey. I think of my uh, Ontario map as hey. I visualize it. So. Yeah, I might invite myself over to Jeff Woods. Place. Also, Jeff Woods, it's gonna sound, it's, okay, so 1010, I've, so, here's where I want to go next. Okay. Okay. And I, this is, you know, the, the utmost respect, but I'm wondering how you deal with what would I call them? Like some of some of the ten ten loyalists who feel their station, which was the <laughs> uh, the dashboard pounding right wing station that they loved, you know, fuck Trudeau and all that. How would you get blowback from the, those people? Which the Gordster who wrote us on Twitter earlier would be one of these types of people who feels now that 
Tenten has moved either closer to the center, maybe in their minds, it's suddenly become like for lefties or something. What say you, Reshmi Nair? Oh, I find it fascinating. Uh, there's this one guy, Rick, who's called in a few times and he, he gets all Elmer Fudd with his mouth and he gets so upset that he starts eating his own words and he's still spitting at me. And the, the last time he called, I just, why are you screaming at me, man? Why are you screaming at me? <laughs> And he said, I'm getting all worked up. I said, yeah, you're working yourself up. If you can't call in and have a calm discussion, then maybe you should just calm yourself before you even start the discussion with yourself. It's interesting. It's fascinating. I think it's... I think anytime you call someone a name, it's just a reflection of whatever you're going through in your day. It doesn't impact me. And I haven't received the kind of harassment on Twitter that I think other people have. Um, I don't pay attention to, uh, you know, like if if anyone wants to call me uh, anything liberal, it always makes me laugh. And I wish my dad was still alive. I don't even know your, I don't even know your political slant. And you're not going to. That's the joke, right? Like this one guy called in and he's like, you sound like you vote green or NDP. And there was just this pause. Right. And I was like, well, we'll keep guessing, dude. Like, are, 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 I'm not even going to ask people. No, to call I think in you vote Communist Party, if I had to guess. But I, I, I don't know. For I sure. don't have a political position <laughs> because at the end of the day, I'm a journalist and I grew up right. being cynical and skeptical of anything and everything. Well, here's, the, here's wh- where I think it comes questions. from. Here's where I think it comes from. OK, so again, you are now the uh, co-host of the, the Rush with uh, Scott MacArthur. And the original co-host of The Rush, uh, we'll put Jay aside. He was a co-host from the, from the start. But Ryan Doyle was sort of a proud card-carrying member of the Conservative Party like this. So I think that's where it comes from, that there, this show was like, was by like, like there was, he was not hiding this fact. Uh, he, I had him in the basement and it was not, he was not hiding the fact that he was like, I think literally, I believe, a member of the party. So not with the, of the, and uh, provincially, we'll say the pro- the Progressive Conservative Party, and now uh, they feel like we don't know what you are, but they knew what Ryan was. They knew Ryan was a guy who was going to vote for uh, Doug Ford's party, but you're you're uh, unknown. So then I think they decide they they think that maybe this is a part of this woke movement, where uh, stations like six forty and ten ten are moving from the right moving to the uh, center or left. Yeah, I mean, I would argue that the stations focus on the news and I would hope that the listeners tune in for the news and I appreciate and respect that any host would build an audience that follows because they know that what they're getting is from that host who they've been familiar with. So that's great. Right. None of that is me. And, and you're not going to get that from me. There is no political slant because I can't put my faith in any politician or political party. That is my honest truth. Right. And we should be, um, you know. And I'm with you, but go on. It, it, we, we should be able to criticize even if it is your party. And so with politics, uh, it, it, it's, it's mind numbing. If you're going to be, if you're going to be the equivalent of a Leafs fan in the political world, <laughs> There's no discussing. There's no discussion to be right had. because that's your team and your team in that you want you root against the other team. Like like I would say like like the Liberal Party is like the Montreal Canadiens and it's like it doesn't matter about platform or who, who the human beings are. But that's the enemy. My team is the Leafs, and that would be, for example, maybe the uh, the Conservative Party of Canada. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But, right. But, so how do you have a conversation if it's uh, polarized like that? Well, and if you. Um, you know, if you if, if you think you know what you're going to hear, that might be something that you're used to and it's muscle memory. So you tune in to hear the familiarity. Right. I think it's also equally entertaining to not know what you're about to hear next <laughs> right. and, and, and build some faith and trust that you are going to hear the truth. That's what we're offering. Scott MacArthur and I will tell you the truth. We will ask questions and we will try to find the truth. But I'm not going to push any agenda, and and I don't think Scott has an agenda either, but maybe what's shocking is that our lived experiences do not reflect whoever is upset when they're when they're tuning in. It, it, it just might be that the name Reshmi sounds woke, and I don't know what this woke well, well, first of all, you- business is, but like if it means that you're waking up from a slumber and you're getting right. smarter, I'm all for it. Just educate yourself. 
Oh, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. But uh, historically, you know, 1010 was the home of uh, straight white my straight white men, right? And now the station is not. It's oh, I'm moving your camera there, Rashmi. The camera loves you. I just moved it on you, though. But <laughs> but uh, you know, it doesn't matter. But okay. But now now suddenly, uh, it's I'd say most hosts on 1010 are not straight white guys. These are all perspectives and observations that can be discussed among people who are interested in having the discussion. Barb DiGiulio was a host on the evenings. She's not a straight white man. No, so, she's not. Yeah. So so the takeaway that people have, I respect. But it not doesn't necessarily reflect the truth. It always has a bit of a skew to it, right? So whatever your impression is, mm-hmm. uh, it could be different. Uh, people assume uh, conservative-minded discussions are white-based. And I am here to say that they're not. Many immigrants who come to this country have conservative minded policies and objectives they uh, the conservative mind doesn't have to be um reserved for you know that old stock canadian if you want to use that term uh but i'm also not here to defend conservatism because there isn't a single party here uh that deserves to be defended uh but i don't i don't subscribe to and i mean i listened to 1010 when i worked at cbc And maybe it's because I'm a journalist that I like to consume news in many different ways. Read the Toronto Sun, read the Toronto Star, read the Globe and Mail. Uh, It's the same for radio for me as well. So I, I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't assume that anything is changing. The names, the voices, and the news are changing. Anything else that's open for criticism is just a personal perspective and sometimes an attack and i'm not here for either of those to be honest no and again all that is just noise that would be just you're you're essentially there to do your very best show with scott MacArthur. like all this stuff that surrounds it and and the 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 dashboard thumping you know people the people who want their conservative talk radio shtick and they don't want it to change that's really not your concern because you're just out there doing your 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 very best with your co-host well, yeah, but you put Jay to the side for this discussion. You know why? He because I did. think it was Ryan. I don't even. But Jay contributed to that same show. Yes, yeah, of course. So I sh- maybe I shouldn't have stuck him all the way to the side. You're right. But I always think of Ryan Doyle driving the conservative nature of the rush. Well, he, as an individual host, was performing the job that he was performing, and somehow it was successful enough. That's what every individual person does in any job. So you, you, you can't, you can't assume, I mean, man, even when you go to a drive through and you order food in a drive through you're going to get a different experience depending on who's in the window. You're still going to the same takeout stop. You're still going to the same drive through So I, I don't, I don't understand why people um, connect the people on air with the company or the station or this underlying message. I, News Talk 1010 is a great source for information and for news discussions. And I know that even though different hosts are going to take different positions, you are going to get callers who bring in other perspectives. It's always been a great place for news discussions. That's not going to change. And if Reshmi and Scott scare you, I hope you pick up the phone and join the discussion. Don't be scared. Don't be scared of Reshmi and Scott, everybody. Uh, you've got three months under your belt now, and uh, here's hoping for a long run. I'm wrong about one thing, which is I thought until we had this conversation that uh, you belonged on TV and that this was just uh, something you were going to do until they found that television spot for you. That's what I thought. Like I'm being straight, I'm being straight with you. Quibi didn't work out. Not your fault. <laughs> Quibi did not work out. Now, you know, they, they, they need a home for you because they believe in you because you're very talented. Again, my thoughts is that you're very talented. Now, so the radio thing, I, I just didn't think radio was where you wanted to be. Lo- I mean, now I've changed my mind listening to you talk to me about your passion for radio and that you wanted to be in radio. But I just kind of assumed you'd end up on TV as soon as, you know, at some point you'd end up as some big time anchor at uh, CTV somewhere. Why? I just think you're a TV star. Why? Why? What is that? I know you see you want to racialize it, but I don't. I my no, no, mind, it's not okay. even racialized. It's just that people think people think that journalists on TV want to be TV stars, and maybe there's a certain percentage, but it's not the majority. It's not when you look at the majority of TV journalists, they're good on camera, 
but they're not trying to be celebrities or stars in their own in their own right. They are doing their job. And I and I I guess I, and I'm not trying to make it rationalized, Mike, but it it is it has been a frustration of mine in this industry in that people look at me and they assume that I want to have makeup on, smiling in front of a camera. No, I want to talk about the okay, news. Okay, so I'm being very honest with you. And if it is, if if like I found it interesting when you mentioned the racialization of that because I never considered like I wasn't thinking. Oh, I was just thinking that you you look good on TV. And I know TV pays better than radio typically, not always, but typically. And I just assumed that because you were good at it and you uh, looked good in the media medium, that that's where you would want to be. This was my assumptions. I bring these assumptions to these conversations sometimes. Uh, I and then love we it. talk for 90 minutes. And then I, at the end of it, I think I was damn right about her. Or sometimes I come out of it and I think I was completely wrong about her. Like that's why we don't do five to seven minutes here. Cause who the hell I need to do like a 90 minutes, hear you out, feel this out. And yeah, yeah. It's been 90 worry. minutes. It up. It's been 90 minutes. But uh, it seems to me like you want to be in radio and this is a, a big fucking station you're on. And uh, if you're looking to talk and not introduce the latest uh, Beyonce song, you are at the primo property owned by Bell Media where you're employed. Like this is the top of the mountain for, you know, talk radio owned by Bell Media. You're there it now. It is. It is. I know. And I'm a brown woman. <laughs> On the afternoon drive. It's huge. Like, look, right. we started this and I appreciate the last 90 minutes because it's making me realize my own life here. Yeah. We started this talking about how I won an Edward R. Edward R. Murrow Award at 40 grand at News 1130. Right. And now I've been able to elevate and come full circle and make, you know, TV money, but in radio. So this is uh, my dream job. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, it's, it's my dream job and I'm going to do everything that I can to hold on to it because I love it. And I love engaging with the listeners, even the ones who don't like even me the or, Gordster. Yeah. Even the ones who aren't sure if they like me or not. Listen, they'll like me by the end of the discussion. Well, people don't like change. Some people, some people don't like change, right? Like some people just don't like change and uh, they have to adapt to a whole new human being. And maybe if they feel like they aren't as passionately uh, hate, uh, hating of uh, Justin Trudeau, for example, that maybe she's just some some lefty who biked to uh, 299. <laughs> so. But you didn't you don't bike to work, do you? I'll walk to work. Scott walks more than I do. I'll walk to work. Reshmi, you've got to come back at some point because uh, I never, I never, maybe I'll ask you real quick here. Uh, what kind of music do you listen to when you're on your own time and you want to hear a good jam? Oh man. Okay. Recently, Bon Jovi. I'll really? I hate I Bon Jovi. Yeah, but you do, but then you don't, right? <laughs> Have you seen them live? No. Okay. Yeah. That's the thing. Once you go to a JBJ show, really? you will listen to Bon Jovi. But I, I own Slippery When Wet on cassette in 87. Yeah. yeah I own it. Yeah. And I liked it in 87. Yeah. And I did like it because you had uh, the big jams on that album. But I grew to despise the band. <laughs> I got to say, maybe you and I need to go to a John Bon Jovi concert at some point. You can turn me around. Dan Mangan as well. I'm into Dan Mangan. I'm into Canadiana for sure. Would you kick out the jams with me at some point? I would love to. I would love okay, to. Okay, this was awesome. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Oh, thank you. Me as and well. And I'll let Scott know I'm taking his place on the rush. It's going <laughs> to be you and I, okay? Just when we need to butt grow. I can grow my hair. My hair grows. Will you I be don't. adversarial though? Fucking right, I'll be adversarial. How many times will you say my name? Every 30 seconds, just like Scott. Uh, <laughs> make sure people know. This is Reshmi Nair. Thanks so much. I'm um, just making sure I gave you all your gifts. Yeah, don't leave without the lasagna, though, because it's in my freezer. But this was amazing. Thank you. And long may you run on the mighty News Talk 1010. That's my wish for you. Cheers. <laughs> and that... That brings us to the end of our 1,076th show. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Toronto Mike. Reshmi is at Reshmi Nair. Nair is N-A-I-R. I think it's two syllables, but it might be one, depending on uh, how much Great Lakes I've drank. Uh, speaking of Great Lakes, they're at Great Lakes Beer. Palma Pasta is at Palma Pasta. Sticker U is at Sticker U. Doer are at Doer Performance, D-U-E-R. That promo code is Toronto Mike. You save 15%. Ridley Funeral Home are at Ridley F-H. And Canna Cabana are at Canna Cabana underscore. 
see you all. Trying to figure out. My next guest, Richard Trapunsky, is on Wednesday. See, that's Ellen Roseman's son, by the way, who wrote for Now for many years. And we'll find out what happened at Now. See you all then. Good.